Good afternoon and welcome to this uh, session covering integrated cancer care and intelligent uh, imaging. My name is Ben Newton and I'm the general manager of the global oncology solutions business at G Healthcare. Uh, this afternoon it's my pleasure uh, to talk to Dr. Claire Bloomfield, who is the chief executive officer of the National Consortium of Intelligent Medical Imaging at the University of Oxford. And also let me welcome uh, Professor Richard Gilbertson, who's head of oncology. He's professor of oncology and director of the Cancer Research UK uh, Cambridge Centre. He's also co-lead of the Cambridge Experimental Cancer Medicine Centre and co-director of the Hutchison MRC Research Centre too, also in, in Cambridge. So let me just say a little bit more about uh, Claire's work at NCME. Uh, Claire brings together world-leading radiologists, clinicians, NHS, NHS hospital network, um, charities as well as patient groups um, to develop new intelligent imaging techniques, transforming how we do diagnose and treat diseases, chronic diseases uh, like cancer too. Mm -hmm. And their goal at NCM is to build a pipeline of innovative imaging tools, uh, AI-assisted um, Using those um, and developing those and having them validated in the NHS is, is really the goal. So it's a very practical focus, very pragmatic focus for high-end uh, research coming into, into clinical practice. And similarly, in terms of Professor Gilbertson's work as leader of the Cancer Research UK Centre, he leads a, a huge team of over 900 um, laboratory researchers focused on um, diagnosing cancer, the, understanding the causes of cancer, and, and of course, um, defining better treatments and discovering better treatments, uh, and, and also educating as well on, on the right um, uh, diagnosis and, and treatments as too. So real welcome uh, to you both. Thank you so much for, for joining this this morning. Um, for everyone who's listening, i uh, just like to add that we'll be running um, uh, a poll throughout. We'll be using Slido and um, an indication as how to respond to the poll will be seen on your screens. Uh, so please do go through um, to Slido and, and uh, cast your opinion. Give us your feedback on uh, what is being shared this afternoon. Uh, we'd love to hear from you and we'd love to be able to uh, respond and connect with you uh, after this after this meeting. So. Um, you'll get a, an indication as to uh, the polls when they appear. Uh, let me start by asking um, Richard, how do you see cancer care right now? Um, how is it um, carried out and, and how do you see uh, integrated cancer care making a difference uh, in the context of, of how it's done today? Yeah, thanks, Ben. It's a great question. Let's start with the positives. Um, obviously, this is UK based from my perspective, although I spent 15 years in the States and so have a, a, also a view on what cancer care is like there. Um, so in developed countries, cancer care is good. Um, I think I think what is good is that you get um, access to the best sort of uh, diagnostic surgery, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, which largely constitutes the care that patients receive almost regardless of what your age is and, and, and what cancer type you have. I think there are, there are two things that, that really worry me about it. The first thing is fragmentation. So if you look at this country, um, if you got in a car and drove 50 miles in any direction, um, your likelihood of surviving cancer, a specific cancer, when you move from one region to the next, changes. And that's complex reasons for that, but largely it's because there is disparity in healthcare across the UK. We're, we're very aware of that. Um, and that's inevitable because of regionalization and expertise, access to different aspects of healthcare, access to research opportunities um, within those different centers. So that's one aspect. But the other thing is, it fra is the fragmentation in the system itself. We're very fortunate in the UK to have the NHS. I think it's a fantastic single party payer system to deliver optimal care. But the fragmentation between primary care and secondary tertiary care is evident, particularly in, in cancer. And so I think there is an opportunity to bring a continuum of care um, to that pathway for patients. 
And the reason for that is because it sort of resonates with the NHS long term plan that was published just very recently for cancer, along also with um, stakeholder um, aspirations such as that Cancer Research UK. And there is a increasing interest in diagnosing cancer early. The long term plan, for example, indicates that it wants 55,000 more patients to be surviving more than five years by the late 2020s and shifting three quarters of patients to early diagnosis. That's going to happen in the community. That's going to happen in primary care. So unless we take this holistic view of patient care pathways spanning from primary care into tertiary care, we're not going to achieve that. So at a very high level, I would say the thing that worries me the most is that fragmentation, both in disparity of care opportunities uh, and also the mechanism by which it's delivered. And then the third aspect is the fragmentation between the research and also um, the actual care aspect. So though that's sort of for me, um, you know, the main concern and, and you know, I'll, I'll shut up and, and obviously let Claire have a go. But the main mm. thing is, is actually how integrated approaches can really solve many of those problems. Mm. No. no, thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Richard. For that. And, and thanks for the clarification, by the way. That's um, fine. Um, so, so actually, in with respect to the point of um, integration and, and taking that holistic view, Claire, I know in terms of the research the NCME team is doing, again, together with the partnerships, you're looking, um, as I see it, and certainly the, the, some of the programmes that we're working together on, uh, holistically and trying to bring some of the patient data together um, and the, the imaging data together to develop um, not only predictive algorithms, but also radiomic tools as, as well. Can you explain a little bit about how you see that um, that process and, and how you are developing those those tools to, to advance that sort of holistic view of, of care? Yep, absolutely. Um, so, and I think what's interesting is some of Richard's worries. I'm hoping I'm gonna tackle those worries almost in some of the responses. So. And CME's focus is, as you've sort of described, about bringing partners from the different aspects of the ecosystem together. So the NHS plus academics, plus industry, plus patient groups to try and tackle some of that sense that you need those different perspectives. And the same holds true for the model of you need primary, secondary, tertiary care linked up and joining patient pathways rather than geographies or um, where the buildings happen to be or who happens to be funded for which component of the pathway. Um, and trying to sort of bridge some of the gaps and bring the right people together, even if they're geographically split or technically split. And as you mentioned, we've been using that model, particularly recently with some work that GE, as well as Roche and one of our SME partners, Optelum, have been involved in, which is trying to embed research into the lung health check programme that's been launched in the UK, which, again, has faced some challenges with setup during the pandemic, but is really about trying to support across 10 pilot areas of the UK, um, improving lung cancer screening programmes. And uniquely, we're embedding research into that from the outset and we'll collect about 150,000 patients worth of clinical questionnaire data, low dose CT, PET CT, blood biomarkers, digital pathology, with exactly that point of integrating those different types of information can generate new insight that will help at different points along that care pathway journey. And particularly you mentioned radiomics. So one scoping of this is can we integrate the PET CT and biopsy digital pathology data to generate new AI solutions, which we have the aspiration could entirely remove the need for those surgical biopsies, which if you remove those globally has a significant impact on care and not only mortality, but also just making care more caring in the way that we're delivering it. So that's one component of that pathway, but it really is about looking about how you embed research along that pathway of care rather than artificially trying to insert things in an in a non-integrated manner. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I guess um, in terms of, uh, Richard, just coming back to you, if I may, around that, um, uh, uh, around examples of integrated care, I mean, Claire mentioned um, uh, removal of biopsy. One of the areas I know that, that you and your team are looking at is is, is sort of a virtual biopsy almost, um, using radiomics to understand the, the biochemical signatures within uh, imaging, um, uh, understanding the texture of, of images almost in the context of 
biochemical expression as a means to predict outcomes, but also predict response to therapies as well. Can you give a, a couple of examples um, or, or, or of how you how you see that coming to, to reality or how that might might evolve over the coming years? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So, so there are quite a lot ongoing in Cambridge. So um, we have sort of similar to the sort of uh, concepts that Claire was describing, um, a very large program in the Cancer Centre, Integrated Cancer Medicine, supported by the Mark Foundation, where we're purposely uh, collecting prospectively in the context of clinical trials. So not retrospective collections, but really in patients who are being treated on current clinical trials, um, uh, both imaging digital pathology as well as liquid biopsy, RNA-seq and other um, whole genome sequencing and other omics. And really addressing the mathematical problem of how do you integrate that data? Um, because at the moment, as physicians, we sort of hold those results a bit like a hand of cards in a poker game, trying to work out whether the king is worth more than the ace, etc. And which one do we put down rather than seeing this as a holistic view of the patient's disease? And how can we mathematically, um, using AI and other approaches, deprioritize in one setting one result um, at, at, you know, sort of focus on one result in particular, because th the relevance of one particular result will be context dependent. It might be very important at one stage of the disease or when it's associated with another finding and less mm -hmm. important in another context. And that truly is a sort of AI deep learning problem. And so we're looking at that aspect and two particular examples related to imaging. One would probably be hyperpolarized imaging, which um, Cambridge has led in. And that. The advantage of that is it gives you a real-time readout, essentially, of the biochemistry of a tumour. Um, the reason that has potential value, although at the moment courses in specialised centres, is that if we put patients on a phase one trial, for example, or a phase two trial, and we're looking at tumour response, at the moment we're still requiring patients to go through two or three cycles of a drug before we can get a readout, and still we use a lot of sort of stable disease and complete response, that kind of um, information that the listeners will be used to listening to or, or, or interpreting in their practice and research. Whereas focus um, areas like hyperpolarization can literally give you a biochemical readout of the impact of a drug within one cycle of a drug. So that's that's a real powerful aspect. Um, in terms of the radiomics, I would say there are other aspects such as, um, for example, particularly in renal cancer, where um, in the Integrated Cancer Medicine Program, we're using imaging to build three-dimensional molds through 3D printing. The tumor is then, and this is integrating the team, the tumor is then resected by the surgeon. The pathologist already has worked with the images to produce those 3D molds. That tumor can then sit in the mold. It allows the individual to orientate and section that tumor and then do um, habitat genomics on that tumor and then cross-reference that back to what we saw in the imaging. Now that sounds like fancy research and it is, but the point of that is that if we can start to understand by simply co-registering regional habitats in a tumour with a deep dive in the genomics, we can then start to correlate back what did that mean within the individual information in an MRI scan or mm. back to a PET scan. And then you can start to, if you do that in enough cases, start to infer that based on just doing the imaging. So those kind of approaches we hope will also democratise access to that kind of detailed information without having that specialized access. And then there are other areas which I think is really exciting to do with things like um, planning for patients. And so, you know, something as complex as ovarian cancer, when those patients might be going for surgery, it's not uncommon in many hospitals to suddenly find, oh, oh dear, we need a, an upper GI surgeon because this tumor is not just involving and where we would expect the tumor to be, but actually we actually need to plan to have an upper GI surgeon for the management of this case. The kind of radiomics approaches that are developing in the team here can actually predict not just where the tumour is, what likely it's going to do from a prognostic perspective, but also work out what sort of team you'll need for the management. And that's really exciting because it has workforce implications. And you can start to see how the people are making the decisions in NHS hospitals. Sure, this is a fancy machine or a fancy approach, but what good is it going to do for us? When it starts to have really hard impact on workforce planning and that kind of thing, that will really speak to those people who hold the purse and make these kind of decisions. So I guess what we're trying to do is is take the best science and, and allow it and enable it to have impact on real world problems so that it can really bring and rapidly progress that to an advantage of patients. Mm. I think it's I think it's fascinating. And, um, you know, the, the point about um, democratization of 
these high-end solutions or these high-end, um, apparently at this stage at least, high-end um, uh, tools. I, I think it's a, it's a really important one, but but also um, supporting the workflow of patients, decision making of, of patients. I, I love I love the the um, the concept of trying to understand which feature is important. You made the analogy to sort of a, a playing a card game. It's like, is this ace going to trump the king and so on? And that idea of, of, of pulling together and making sense of biomarkers in the context of a particular stage of, of, of a cancer is really important, I think. And Claire, in, in terms of how, you, how you're using some of those tools, um, developing algorithms, trying to understand and weight some of those features or classifiers of disease. I know that's central to what you're doing from a um, predictive analytics perspective, particularly, I mean, not cancer, but COVID, but other yes. uh, examples as, as well. Do you see that same challenge um, or, or do you see this problem in the same way, I, I, I guess, in, in terms of how you're looking at it from an NCME perspective? Um, I, so, yes, absolutely. A, a lot of what Richard said resonated. And I think one of the potential gaps, but where it really needs to focus is you'll always have areas of academic research expertise that can drive new insight. But the critical bit is then how you scale that into a system that will not be able to embed that high end whiz bang solution into care. And this is where I think imaging is fascinating because it's an existing system that you can enhance the outputs of that without fundamentally altering the technology itself. So the ability to reverse engineer new AI or multimodal information back into something that you could see deployed, not just into the NHS, but I think in this sort of global perspective as well, thinking about how global health will work. So you've really got to think about how this is reverse engineered into environments where there are workforce shortages, there are limited scoping in terms of cutting edge tech. So really um, addressing those existing needs while still having this eye to world leading innovation that is kind of just going to take a stepwise change in the way you're considering cancer care. So I think it's fascinating to think about how you combine those two things together. So new insight, which um, currently clinicians don't have access to or where computers is going to just be better at trying to integrate those different kinds of data than the clinicians are, but providing that as just an additional tool back to the cl clinicians for decision making. So I don't see this again replacing radiologists. It becomes radiologists have a very different and expanded role almost to take this data back and then think about how it will be um, how those decisions will be used in the care of those individual patients. So it's more insight and then more opportunity for that radiology community to really help drive decision making for, for care pathways. So uh, that's embedded again, I think, into how NCME designs its work is, can you generate AI imaging biomarkers? Um, Richard was talking about hyperpolarization. Um, Fergus Gleason out of Oxford has been a long standing champion of xenon hyperpolarization. And we've seen some really fascinating insights coming out of that for COVID around functional thoracic imaging, which doesn't exist really as a speciality that's something you could see deployed in care. It exists in other areas of radiology, but this idea of functional imaging being something that can you embed back, even if you haven't got xenon hyperpolarization, can we correlate it back to standard of care CT? Are there ways of gathering more insight from the technology that's broadly available and therefore you drive up the um, ability to make important decisions across the whole of the system. So again, it's about that, how can you democratize the insights to make sure they're accessible to everybody? And I, th I think that's gonna be critical. No, it's fascinating. And I saw actually reached the, reached the new BBC News just in terms of the detection of perhaps an underlying problem relating to long COVID, which, which was fascinating. It just underlines the issue of um, I think uh, MRI is uh, and its potential. Going back to the points, I think R Richard, you you were saying, um, the issue of um, the application of AI and and some of these tools in in radiology. Um, I think uh, in workforce planning improvements in in workforce planning, perhaps making life easier is a theme. I know that you you, you care about in terms of the dialogue between. The specialties in making a, 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 a diagnosis but the, the point that um, I think Claire made but you also made in those centres where there is a, a, a lack of cutting edge technology this is the point isn't it if you, if you create um, algorithms or if you identify 
features but are validated to high end um, endpoints, if I can put it like that, actually and, and to develop a surrogate to predict disease or surrogate for differentiation of disease, then actually you can translate the power of that um, mm -hmm. uh, that technology without necessarily having it in a sense. And, and is that something that you see as part and parcel of of how we might be able to support the the whole cancer journey and of course improve um, the the workflow and um, again democratization of, of these technologies to, uh, throughout the the, the the physician population? Yeah, absolutely, definitely. So I think I think there are critical aspects of delivering the best cancer care. One of those is we want to deliver care as soon as possible, which means as early as possible in disease and as close as possible to home. Um, also, I think just in terms of the way, so my experience of working in district general hospitals, not in, I've worked in academic healthcare centres and in district general hospitals. Some of the best healthcare I've seen have been in district general hospitals. Yeah. I, I mean, the, the physicians, nurses, health, allied healthcare professionals in those institutions are phenomenal. Um, they're, they're incredibly well trained, highly practiced with, you know, between them decades and decades of years of experience. Uh, just because they don't have access to a fancy machine doesn't um, in any way suggest that the healthcare that can't be provided there couldn't be outstanding um, and equivalent to what could be provided in an academic healthcare centre. So the point about the technology for me is, is that it, it's, it further enables, and Claire's made this point, it further enables and accelerates the ability of them to deliver that care without the need to go to some kind of shiny ivory tower to get mm. you know a, a fancy scan or whatever it might be and i think this is a really important sociological psychological problem among the population um i think it's very important that that individuals where they're living have absolute confidence in their local healthcare so they know that wherever they are they're going to have the best possible access to healthcare so by using technology to ensure that we put into the hands of those experts and um, local individuals in the regional hospitals the ability to deliver at that level democratized access to fantastic sort of imaging integrated aspects, which can be done now. We have the technology to do that through sort of software approaches that just further instills in the population the confidence that they are going to a center of excellence because it's backed up by this kind of quality. And for me, that can only be good because it, it you can't, a system where you have two or three centers of absolute superb excellence and then sort of you know, everywhere else that delivers healthcare, it isn't sustainable. Mm. Now, of course, there's always going to be bleeding edge healthcare, there's always going to be research, and that will be centred in academic healthcare centres. That makes sense. There's always going to be the latest cutting edge technology and research, which has to be restricted to certain sites for delivering certain interventions. That makes sense. But that doesn't mean the rest of healthcare, we can't accelerate that to becoming standard of practice as close as possible to where patients live. And for me, that's the exciting aspect of this, um, is that it really ensures that wherever you are, you're accessing the best possible decisions, the best possible healthcare, and we're empowering those clinicians on the ground to do that. Um, mm. And that, that to me is a really exciting opportunity that this provides. And, and could, I, could I add to that? Well, Sorry, I was just, because I think, again, it speaks to the experiences we've had. So, and see me, as you know, Ben has 14 NHS trusts and they vary from large academic hubs to DGHs. And I think DGHs play a critical role in innovation and research as well. And in fact, they're often the quicker adopters of innovation if it's available because they're not embedded in their own R&D programmes as some of the academic teaching hospitals are. And so there's almost this reverse loop of where the DGHs can drive early adoption of innovation when it's ready to deploy. And some of our trusts in Truro and Frimley, they are critical to that component of this ecosystem for innovation is they're, they're not just waiting to receive things handed down from the Oxfords and the Cambridges, they're directly providing a critical role in terms of evaluation and supporting adoption, which is still one of the things in the UK I think the NHS struggles with is adoption at scale and providing more of that evidence of how this will work in clinical practice. So those, as I say, those partners I think have a critical role to play in supporting deployment of innovation um, and not just recipients of something when it's ready to kind of translate through. I think just to clarify, because I know there, there'll be um, yes. people outside the UK um, 
DGA, Sorry, we need to translate it, right? District yeah. General Hospital, I guess, is 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 my my um recollection. Is that is that correct, Claire? That's right. That's why I use the term regional hospital, which is more commonly used, certainly where I worked in the States. Yeah. Uh, so re regional but, hospitals. But I think that this is an important point and and sort of as we as we sort of transition into in sort of the next phase of the discussion, what I wanted to, to ask you actually was there's there's a there's some great examples that you've shared around how um it's possible to develop AI to develop solutions that can support decision making um, around stratifying patients for tailoring therapies and so on. So this is happening. This is this is coming. Uh, it, it seems. But how? What are the barriers? What are what's preventing um, this democratization? This um, adoption of, of of tools? How can we sort of empower? if you like, um, physicians everywhere, um, radiologists in particular, but also treating physicians um, to, to, to actually um, to take this on. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to the role of industry in a moment, because I know I, I, I'm, I'm probably thinking, especially for that, but what, what in generally, what, it, 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 the sort of general level do you think is needed to sort of facilitate this? And sorry, and I'll come back to you, Richard, first, maybe. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I think the first thing is, is it has to be owned by the community. So um, one of the things that we're, we're really pushing through the activity involved in Cambridge is this is not a Cambridge um, solution for the world. That would be ludicrous. And, and Claire's um, pointed to this already that, you know, this is a this has to be a partnership. If it's going to, to work in every single hospital, for example, in the NHS, it has to be owned from the start by that. The other thing is, is that the, the individuals working on the ground, the radiologists, the radiographers, um, the other individuals involved in the broader cancer care, they know what the problems are. They know what solutions they need on a day to day basis. It's not for us to say to this is what you need. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's for them to be part in the research process, because unless they own it, they're not going to use it. And I think so. One of the biggest hurdles to start with is the fact that you come up with the wrong solution um, or you work hard on things which you think are, are the right solution, but they're subtly not quite. And then that has problems of acceptance when it's ready. Um, so it should be developed in a co-partnership with those individuals. I think there are still real um, research issues as well, which again speaks to having the engagement of, of um, all of the healthcare pipeline in, in the solution to sort of work on that research problem because as you know, I mean, you've you've been in discussions with us in in um, Cambridge, Ben. It's, you know, this is very much still a research problem. We're still trying to grapple with how do you do this. You know, anyone can produce a nice shiny app that does stuff, but actually, if you sent it to Great Yarmouth or you know um, Peterborough or or Newcastle where I used to work or or Manchester wherever, um, all great centres. You're going from sort of really strong district generals, regional hospitals up to really great. Um, science centres of excellence like Manchester or Leeds or Newcastle, mm -hmm. for it to be working across that, that spectrum, it has to add something to daily practice. So your busy consultant on the ground who's got their MDT, they're not interested in a new toy. They want this to make a difference to their lives so that it makes things quicker. What I'm excited about with this AI technology, it can produce massive improvements in an MDT setting. So now, for example, rather than discussing 20 patients, Maybe we need to focus on these two patients who have real challenges. The approach can actually help bring solutions or ideas to discuss around those individuals, but also because of the deep learning approach, which has got the experience of thousands of patients, say what's safe to do with the other, I don't know, 10 patients who are perhaps more routine. So, you know, it, it really is empowering to focus on those that need it, but it has to mean something to the, to the teams on the ground doing the work, because otherwise, you know, it's just a fancy tool that they're not really interested in. Mm. That's important, Claire. I think in terms of how radiologists in particular um, might use such technology, radiologists um, uh, are, are in demand across MDTs. If if you think about the way cancer is driven, and, 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 and Richard has described this, um, you, you have a, a, a pulmonology or a urology or a surgical MDT. Actually, radiologists are on them all. Um, because they're providing that 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 information. So moving from um, you know covering all of the patients to perhaps covering the just the 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 ones that require detailed um, discussion or 
may be challenging for whatever reason. Is is that the way that you're seeing things or hearing from um, the radiology community in, in, in the NCME um, network? So as certainly I think with so there are we can be excited about the future, but we also know we've got real problems right now. So there is in regions of the UK, 44% workforce shortages in radiology. And I think that it's important to sort of note, particularly to this audience, that we know that that's the problem. So we can talk about the exciting part of the possible, but there's this very practical, real problem now. And so some of the needs around AI have to tackle that. And I think this speaks back to Richard's point of researchers can come up with really interesting, innovative solutions. But right now, there is a problem is that there's more work than there is bandwidth to support and deliver the care as is needed right now, let alone improvements in care. So AI, I think, has a huge role to play in that, not just within cancer, but beyond in terms of triaging of cases, prioritising of workload and helping make those focusing areas. Where are you going to point the lens? Where are you going to zoom in on? Because that's where you think there's the most risk. There are obviously there are fears around this. Clinicians rightly are well trained and have spent many, many years learning this art and AI can't replace the art form of clinicians. So it's how do you use it as an additional tool? And again, that comes back to Richard's point of we need to think about what the clinicians actually say they need. And um, again, you can get academic clinicians who have great, exciting ideas that they're passionate about. But how do you support that to be deployed into NHS trust or across the healthcare system at scale? And those are different types of problems. And that's where, again, you come back to you need different types of viewpoint at the table so that you design solutions that will actually not only answer a clinical problem, but will be able to be embedded into a care pathway in a way that helps people rather than creates an additional burden. Radiologists don't need another drop down box and another software solution they have to go into and another thing that they have to interpret. We don't need more. We need integration of those things. And then, as I say, it's appreciating the realities of the IT systems aren't great. The workforce is overstretched. The consequences of the pandemic means we have an exhausted workforce. The last thing most people want to hear is there's more shiny things you could be doing. It's I can't do now. How mm. can I do now better? And that's, I think, the urgent piece we need to fix as part of this as well, as mm. well as having that horizon to transformation. Mm. So, I mean, that, that's, that's, a, that's a great summary, Claire. And I think in terms of um, you know, trying to facilitate this um, access to tools that have such power. Actually, I'm hearing it's about simplicity. It's about practicality. It's not another click um, amongst all of the other clicks to open various different systems. It's integrating those systems into into a, perhaps in a single um, system where that data is visible, where physicians, treating physicians, as well as um, referring physicians can actually um, see a patient's data and, and, and act on it. But but keeping it very simple, very practical and uh, and obviously not providing more barriers to to care or, or more time consuming um, uh, opening of, of systems. And um, well, yeah, that's, that's, so a, that's already a, a problem. Um, I've got my phone and I've got I don't know how many apps on here. I don't think radiologists want to be the equivalent of having to go into multiple different AI solutions for each particular indication for each patient they go to. Mm. It has to build into the existing frameworks that people have already got so that you do make this deployable and deployable at scale. And that's where, again, you look at the pandemic, there was a lot of great effort to try and tackle and support responses in both AI and non-AI spaces. But you've got machine learning groups working in isolation from the clinicians on the front line. It's like, what is the problem I'm facing and can you help me fix this? Not can AI find something? So that's where you come back to co-creation and you need industry and academia and jobbing clinicians and patients all together from the outset to make sure that you're asking those different questions and you're addressing those pieces as you design the solutions. Mm. Is that the answer, Richard? I mean, I think I mean, we we talked about simplicity and 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 developing um, sort of tools that are uh, easy but also clear in terms of uh, the, the patient data. Um, but in terms of how industry and particularly med tech companies like GE that that uh, that that I work for, 
helping that process? Is it around trying to co-create or helping um, you know develop these sorts of technologies that that works with you? And, and your colleagues in radiology and, of course, all of the other stakeholders. Is, is that the key, that co-creation piece? Yeah, I, I think it is. I think it. I think also it's also the philosophy, however. So um, the philosophy, the outputs, if you like, for companies and academia are very different. The outputs of academia are, um, you know, ethereal advances in intellectual, uh, you know, uh, inputs. They are papers. They are the next grant. They are, you know, advancing mm. you know, understanding of various areas. Yeah. Without necessarily historically an eye on impact, it, it it's really more about um, the freedom to grow understanding. Companies are absolutely based on the bottom line and products, and I think academia and I've tried to, we're trying to do this in Cambridge and we're doing it I think quite effectively is to bring the concept of product to the academic process that's not to restrict it you know the the the, the balance is allowing the freedom in research to, to still produce that creation but also learn from um the the, the sort of philosophy of of companies that actually there has to be a product at the end of this that means something and so what we're doing, for example, um, with integrated cancer medicine is to bring the rigor of a target product profile, which you'll see mm -hmm. in industry. So it has to do this. It has to look like this. It has to work in this kind of context. It has to have these parameters, which not tra isn't traditionally how one would govern or put walls around a research project. So I think it's actually, yes, it's about the co-creation, but it's actually about the discipline and the thought processes that companies can bring to an academic environment to bring that level of rigor. Because yes, this will be driven by the research, the ideas will, will fuel this, but actually to make this work in, you know, in West Suffolk, in Staley Bridge, in wherever it is, in, in you know, York Hospital, wherever it is on a Monday morning, that needs the sort of biotech thought processes and product which has rigor and works and is robust. Um, the last thing you want is a researcher like me designing something like that because it will just go down loads of rabbit warrens and stuff because that's what we're designed to do. So I think that that for me is a really exciting aspect of research biotech partnership. It's bringing those philosoph philosophies together and then will be really impactful for patients, I think. Mm. And, and uh, what, what's fantastic about working with with both of you and and and, and your teams is is the passion uh, around um bringing the research to reality or bring it to bedside i mean it's 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 often said but i think to make um to really realize the value of the research it has to make a difference in patients lives and i think that's the process that that we're also passionate about and and, and just thrilled to be to be working um with with you on I guess then, in terms of coming back to uh, medtech in 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 enabling that, it, it's through co-creation, but it's 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 through deep partnership, and it, and it's not just about funding; it's actually sharing the the best that's available around product management, productization, with the best that's available in terms of of, of research, and um, just sort of broadening the scope of of this. Do all of these themes apply beyond the UK? I, I think they do, but I'd be keen to get your perspective because you're both working extensively globally, not just in the UK, but these themes are common to uh, the rest of Europe and EMEA and, and of course, um, the wider world, China, as well as, as US. Can you comment a little on your experience of, of these issues and the challenges that exist around adoption pragmatism, if you will, and 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 bringing this sort of uh, research to, to bedside or certainly into into hospital a reality. Maybe start with with Claire, if, if, if that's all right. Yep, absolutely. So I think there are some fundamentals at play, which I spent probably the last 20 years around Oxford and variously in the US and elsewhere, where trying to herd the cats. And I think that's uh, the herding of the cats is whether it's cancer, whether it's AI, whether it's cardiovascular disease, whether in fact it's even a healthcare problem, 
you need to have people who individually all have their particular priority. So industry will be product to market. NHS will be service delivery now. Academic is the publication tomorrow. Patient is what can you do to improve mine and my family's care? You have to herd those groups together and then support them in a conversation where you translate and get the, the different groups to understand the cultural issues, the particular priorities, and how you then find something that creates value back out for everybody. And I think that is not a UK problem. You need local expertise on the ground. You need to understand the cultural context. The reasons and why you would deploy a solution in Africa will look very different to the reasons you deploy it into Cornwall. Mm. We can't translate for somebody else. You need that diversity of viewpoint embedded into how you do that. But it's the same types of things wherever you are. So get the different viewpoints in the ta- at the table, get those different insights articulated. And I think this is where partnerships like we have with GE, where you can have those frank conversations. You can't have partnership in name only. You've got to be able to have the frankly blunt conversation to say, it's never going to work. And I know you want this check cutting to do your piece of R&D, but that's blue skies and it's never going to make it to clinic. Mm. If you can't short circuit that, you can spend years and years circling around something that won't deliver impact. So I come back to, it's just about people and different people's viewpoints being brought to the table. So, and I know that can sound a bit motherhood and apple pie potentially, but I do think it's genuinely necessary to deliver things that meet those different needs of those groups. And one is not more important than the other, they're all necessary. So let's name them all and then try and help everybody and get something back out of it. That's that's fair. And, and Richard, I mean, I'm gonna ask you the same question, but maybe put in a, in a slightly different way. Um, because we know time is of the essence in cancer, early screening, um, identifying and stratifying so well that uh, the best possible treatment based on the, the understanding of a particular patient uh, can be applied is, is key. Um, so map, mapping or aligning the, the, the diagnosis and treatment quickly and precisely, that's key um, anywhere in the world, whether you're uh, in the US and Africa or, or um, Europe or, or indeed in, in, in Asia. Is that true? And is it um, a question of simplicity that we're aiming for in that, in that process to, to, to make it easy for everyone and, of course, um, optimise the patient outcomes to boot? Is, is that the focus, do you think? Yeah, I think, I think uh, this is going to sound a bit crass, but I think at its basis, the one thing that unites it everybody is the fact we're all human and we all largely suffer from the same diseases so that Mm. fits the easy bit right the easy bit is the fact that lung cancer is common across the world breast cancer is common across the world all right there are differences in it um which um based on ethnic origin and and regional differences across the world but largely the disease is the same because we're all the same species the geopolitical and economic differences between those areas are vast and that's the big problem so I think if we really want to produce solutions that work for mankind globally, the biggest hurdle is going to be ge- geopolitical and economic. So even in the States where I was, we could say, yes, um, th- there's a difference between the UK and the US. Absolutely. Um, the one thing that brought me back to the UK was the NHS. I think it's fantastic. Um, you only have to live in the US for a period of time and to see the disparity in healthcare based on your economic ability to pay. And you start to understand what the NHS actually means in terms of public health care. It's very different in the US in terms of you know there's a, there's a large resistance for for political reasons why why people feel very differently about private health care versus public health care. And I understand that, but that's a real hurdle to actually implement something which provides democratized care for everybody. So while that's a bit vague and woolly, I think. When you asked that question a while ago, well, what are the hurdles? It's dead easy for us to sort of think about the research complications and the research challenges and almost the healthcare challenges. But at the at the implementation stage, they aren't the hurdles. The implementation stage, who's going to pay for this? How do you access it? Where is it going to be implemented? Those are the hurdles at the end of the day, at the coal face of clinical provision to impact patients. And you can have the best solution in the world. But if there's not agreement on how that gets implemented, who pays for it, how, who accesses it, et cetera, they will be the hurdles which will block this at the end of the day. Now, I think I think 
I very much hope that the impact of the patients that this will demonstrate will produce pressure politically for things like this to be delivered. But mm. I think they are really important issues to grapple with as we think about, you know, on a population scale, implementing this kind of research. I guess, so I was just going to, I couldn't agree more, Richard. I think it just comes back to, again, the, and this is where I think industry, particularly global players like G, can have a real role to play because they are aware of the markets and the market drivers in the way that academic or clinical communities where something might have been developed can't possibly and shouldn't reasonably need to become expert in. But we know very much from experience that some of our SME partners, the way they market their products in the US are very different to the way they would market them in the UK. And understanding that workforce efficiency and cost reductions is what's going to help you deploy in the NHS, whereas new innovation innovation and new insight, where the insurers will pay for it in the US, will be the driver of deployment. And those are very different pieces in terms of how you design those solutions and how you then regulate and provide the evidence base for them. And I don't think the academics and clinical communities alone can solve that, which is where you come back to you need to think about the whole pipeline from blue skies R&D all the way through to the deployment at global scale. And look, I, I think it's a great um, it's a great po point to uh, end, end this discussion in a way, because I think both of you making the point that Yes, there's a, a role for medtech, um, for a role for um, you know, academic groups, um, groups, of course, like in CIMI, as well as um, societies and charities, as, as, as we've described in this. There's a tremendous opportunity, uh, I think, as we see, to drive and, and support precision in diagnosis, precision in treatment, um, and that could drive, uh, of course, improved healthcare outcomes. I think, as as is being discussed actually at this ECR, an opportunity, <clears throat> excuse me, to to drive improved health economics as well, even productivity at the, at the national level. But it comes down to the point I think you were making, um, Richard, around who's going to pay? How can these technologies be accessed? Um, those are perhaps the biggest hurdles, and those are facilitated in to to a large extent by you know, geopolitics, public policy, government policy as well. And those things are, um, of course, at the heart of it. So again, I think the final word perhaps is around partnership. And it's beyond even all our um, uh, uh, kind of uh, realms of responsibility. We've got to do this uh, in a much broader way and a much more holistic way um, to, to drive those outcomes. Um, I really want to thank you for your time this afternoon. It, it's been really fascinating I've, I've learned a lot just actually listening um I, i've taken plenty of notes actually as, as well so I've, thanks very much for your insights um your time especially and um looking forward to uh to to talking to you again soon i hope everybody who's listened to this uh, conversation has understood a little bit more perhaps may uh ha, ha given you an opportunity to reflect on some of the ideas some of the concerns some of the issues in relation to integrated cancer care and of course, the role of in intelligent uh, imaging. Um, as I said at the start of the um, session, uh, we uh, uh, have uh, run a poll. So please come and uh, respond to the uh, uh, to the poll. Uh, also, we uh, have uh, an opportunity to discuss this uh, session and get your ideas and your thoughts through LinkedIn and Twitter and so on. So if you have access to those platforms, please do. Uh, comments. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. And um, with that, uh, thanks again, Richard. Thank you again, uh, Claire. And to everyone else who's been listening, thank you for joining. And um, uh, hope you have uh, a good conference and we look forward to speaking again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ben.